Welcome to Murfreesboro Storytellers. With this edition of Storytellers, we address the homeless situation in our community, and we'll be bringing to you several experts and those actually involved in the situation in our community and helping to make it better. We have, first of all, Dr. Bill Krause, who is Executive Director of H3 ARC. Correct. Dr. Krause, welcome to the program. Welcome, and thank you very much. It's a great, great pleasure to be here this afternoon and be talking about a, another aspect of Rutherford County and specifically the city of Murfreesboro. And you're, as Executive Director, what is your role? I am a new, newcomer. Mm -hmm. I just assumed this position on a part-time basis All two right. months ago and it is to coordinate, implement, and activate uh, much of the objectives and goals of HARC, working with nearly 60 organizations within the community, both uh, public agencies, nonprofit, and uh, faith-based organizations, okay. to address the overall problem of homelessness. Okay. And we do have a, that problem in our community. Well, the sorry, problem, sorry. as I have discovered, is far greater than the normal perception of it. People usually think of homelessness as basically people living under a bridge or yes, living in the yes. woods. Homelessness is far more comprehensive. When you talk to the local school districts, there's over 3,000 children in one form or another whose families in one degree or another experience homelessness. I recall the story shared with me here recently about a principal in a local school where two brothers, uh, seven and eight years old, came to the principal and said, we're not going to have a home tonight, can you help us? Mm. And uh, people who financially are out, the affordability of housing to a great degree is what contributes to the fact of people not being able to uh, live and find a residence either by purchase or by rent. I understand that we have uh, evidence of uh, families even living in cars or multiple families at homes. Yes, absolutely. And then there's a whole dimension that, uh, again, as they say, I'm in the learning curve of uh, grandparent homelessness. The grandparent whose uh, children are no longer in the scene and the grandparent has to take over the raising of the children okay. and finding the cost of housing becomes extraordinarily prohibitive and has some very serious problems. So homelessness is really twofold. One is the emergency, the immediacy. That is somebody who is out in the street, especially with this cold weather, the facilities to take care of them immediately. And the second and probably the long term is a transitional. Once you can stabilize the situation, the ability to, quote, work toward a housing uh, correctness for okay. them. What are some of the things that you as executive director can do and are doing to overcome this problem? There's four areas that our executive committee, which is, uh, consists of 14 men and women representing the different uh, agencies, organizations within the community, have pretty well spelled out. It's been a long dream of Murfreesboro and a long dream of city and county governments and a long dream of many of the people committed to build a campus, a one-stop center uh, that treats everything from the immediacy that is uh, overnight uh, conditions to the ability to find housing, to employment, to the ability to provide food. So to respond to both the immedi immediacy as well as take the long-term process for the uh, family. You would need an area in the community? Absolutely, to, uh, that's what we're working on at this point, correct. Working closely with the Salvation Army and the Journey uh, of journey Life. Journey Home. Huh? The journey Home, right. You understand that Journey Home does quite a bit of wonderful work. We'll find out about more about that later in the Absolutely. program. Absolutely, and uh, Scott is one of our key uh, foundations within the program. Okay. Dr. Cross, define H3 ARC. That stands, that for me. Uh, that stands for Housing, Health, and Human Resources Alliance of Rutherford County. And rather than spell it out all the time, it's so <laughs> easy to say yes. ARC. But it basically are the three priorities, and certainly housing still is the number one priority. But you want to be sure that the folks are, uh, have a place to sleep one night and have uh, food and have immediate assistance. Where is the funding for H3 ARC coming from? Uh, presently, between uh, the city of Murfreesboro and, the, and Rutherford County, utilizing specific HUD grants. Okay. So it's basically coming from housing and urban development. All right, so you have, uh, there are some federal funds involved in That's that. That's basically 100% yeah, right now. Mainly, uh huh. What could uh, a local citizen do to help out with the problem? Are you seeking uh, volunteers, I'm workers? So, I'm so happy you asked that okay. question. Let me give you a, before I answer that, a commentary of Murfreesboro. 
I've been in many communities over the many years, initially as a city manager for a number of years, uh, both in Southern California as well as Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this not to be ingratiating, but to say this from a totally an amazing observation. This is one of the most hospitable, open communities of volunteers I have ever experienced. The men and women committed not just to homelessness, mm -hmm. the men and women committed to wanting to make their community and its people uh, do well. And the amount of volunteers that comes through the churches, that comes through the nonprofits that are devoted to different aspects of uh, poor people or aspects of homelessness is second to none. So Murfreesboro deserves a, and Rutherford County deserves a big A plus on what they're doing. But as a result, each of these groups uh, certainly encourage volunteerism. And whether it's through one's church or whether it's through one's nonprofit, uh, we just saw for the first time this last weekend the Cold Patrol. And the Cold Patrol is men and women uh, devoted to making sure that any of the homeless who are living out in the community, when the temperature automatically goes 32 degrees or below, mm -hmm. they are brought into two shelters and two churches in downtown Murfreesboro so that they're given warmth, given protection. Do you need more churches to provide facilities? Absolutely, absolutely. We never have enough, and uh, the more we have, and it also becomes a commitment and a passion. Mm -hmm. It's not just the fact of doing. You suddenly see, you know, we can describe Murfreesboro as a community where you've got downtown and the historical, you've got a community with uh, the medical center, a community with the university, but this is a community that has hundreds of people either living or affected by it, uh, the homeless community. And it's something that, you know, they weren't born that way. They didn't devote themselves to be homeless. And while there's mental illness involved and while there's uh, uh, alcoholism and drug uh, abuse on some, one of the greatest issues that we are concerned with on homelessness are the veterans. Mm -hmm. And many of these uh, folks who came back from Iraq and from Afghanistan uh, literally, and going through the VA hospital and VA service, uh, find themselves in need of connection and they ultimately find themselves homeless. So we find the veterans to be a significant objective of attempting to work with. Does the Alvin C. York VA Medical Center uh, work with the homeless veterans in particular? They do. We have a very close relationship <clears throat> with them. Do some of the homeless people be become that way voluntarily? It's awfully hard to identify. I just had the opportunity from coming back from a two-day regional conference put on by Housing and Urban yes, Development tell us more about that. in Miami. And uh, they said there really isn't a single cause of homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, believe it or not, and this is kind of a strange thing to say, but homelessness initially began in California in 1966. Did not realize. When the governor had uh, said we're going to save a great amount of money and open the doors of the mental institutions and said, we have no alternative, we're just going to allow hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of folks to mm -hmm. hit the street. And other governors and other states followed that same precedent and saying, well, you know, it's not a political agenda to care. They didn't have an advocacy. And uh, consequently had many folks who had been institutionalized out in the street. And from that began the roots of uh, people looking for the uh, homelessness. In my short period of time, I've had the opportunity to walk and visit those encampments that are here in uh, uh, the Murfreesboro area. And I found it extremely interesting to talk to these folks. And there was a commonality that they did not like organization, structure, rules, and regulations. Okay. And after visiting with them, what was strange is that they had created their own structure <laughs> and their own rules and regulations in order to be live, living by each other. Uh, so there really isn't one cause. A lot of it is people who have uh, no longer have a family support, no longer perhaps have a friend, friend community, mm -hmm. uh, they're out of work. Although I have to say a lot of homeless are working. But the problem is the affordability of housing oh, is yes, what drives yeah. them uh, to an area. So there are those that are working and, and, and some looking for jobs. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. When the one in Kemp and I uh, visited, a goodly number of them actually were working, but they said we just cannot even afford uh, the most minimal house or apartment. Anybody interested, wh where should they go? Or how should they get in touch with 
you and others that are working on the problem? Uh, I would probably say, since he's going to be on your program, I'd probably say I couldn't think of two better people okay. than Journey Home All right. and uh, Greenhouse Ministries okay. with uh, Cliff. I can see those would be the two primary. But on the other hand, uh, anyone who may have a relationship with the church, great place okay. to go. Uh, um, I would be happy to give my phone number, right. if that's okay, 615-310-5173. Sure. Again, that's 615-310-5173. Dr. Krauss, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it was totally my pleasure, and keep up the great work. As we address the homeless problem, we're pleased to have had Dr. Bill Krauss, who is executive director of H3 ARC. Now we're pleased to have Scott Foster, who is executive director of Journey Home, and Kim Snell for the Rutherford County Schools, where she is in charge of the Atlas Liaison for Students. Welcome to Murfreesboro Storyteller. Thank Good you. Good to be here. An interesting issue to discuss, uh, your work with, with, with the community. Uh, Kim, tell us about Atlas. Uh, how, does, how does that name come about and what, what actually is it? Okay, ATLAS is the program with Rutherford County Schools for families in transition or students who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. It was actually, it's an acronym for Academic Time Leads to Achieving Students, which just references the fact that we're eliminating barriers to the attendance and enrollment of homeless children in our schools. Um, it, it's a broader definition of homelessness mm -hmm. than um, what we typically see with HUD or with the, the people that are served at Journey Home and mm -hmm. wh what you typically think of as homeless in the community because the education definition includes, it, it, like I said, it's children who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. So that includes families that are sharing the housing of other families okay. um, due to a loss of housing or financial <coughs> hardship, not in a roommate type situation, but dependent on that other family. It also includes children who are living in motels, um, mm -hmm. campgrounds, of cars. course, cars, yeah. emergency shelters, um, all of those typical okay. scenarios that we think of. What would be the total number? Have any idea? Sure. We had 1,250 last year in Rutherford County Schools. 1,250. Yes. And the city school also has a program, I, I presume. City schools has, um, they just call it McKinney-Vento students. Okay. And I think they had two to 300 last year. I'm not sure of okay. their number. Scott, tell us about Journey Home. We. We, we pass by there from time to time and see a lot of folks uh, waiting to be able to be fed, I presume. Sure. Um, the Journey Home is a, a Christian outreach center uh, where the community comes together to take care of those who are struggling with homelessness or, mm -hmm. or other poverty-related issues. Um, the, the philosophy behind what we do is to use day-to-day -day, uh, resources to build relationships with folks. Uh, and in those relationships, mm -hmm. we can um, understand better their situation because everybody's situation is very different uh, and also um, help them put together uh, some plans and goals and and uh, steps that, that they want to take to move in a different direction uh, so we do things like uh, provide hot meals and food staples a uh, place to wash your clothes um, you know a lot of times we take for granted things that we have in our homes that those who are, are homeless or unstably housed really lack um, it's a place to get your mail. You know, it's hard to get your mail if you don't have an address. I guess that's right. Um, a place to take a shower. One of the things that, that we found that's a common thread uh, with the folks that we serve, and we do serve a lot of the chronically uh, homeless in our community, um, is that many times when, when all these issues come together, they become overwhelming to the point that people begin to um, lose their sense of self-worth, their sense of value. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if people sort of get the idea that they have no value, then there's really no reason for them to invest in themselves mm -hmm. and even think about a future, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and of course, that's, that's, that's not God's perspective and it's not our perspective. Uh, and, and our perspective is that everybody has uh, immense value. Absolutely. Uh, and sometimes you can, uh, it's little things that help people um, sort of get the idea that yes, there can be hope for something different there can be a different pathway uh, that I might be able to, to achieve success uh, going down. And you know, one of the things that uh, makes Kim's program uh, so, so very important um, is that one of the fastest growing parts of the homeless population is families with kids. 
you know. Uh, outside of our center, uh, over on West Castle Street, uh, we have um, about, I don't know, 20 or 25 uh, homes and apartments that we, we house people in our community as we're working with them, kind of getting their feet back under them and setting forth in a new direction. And, um, you know, most of those are families with children. Uh, nationally, and we find also locally, uh, that really uh, almost half, really a little over 40 percent of our homeless population today is families with children. I see. Uh, very, very different than it would have been a generation or two ago. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different reasons that that's occurred. But uh, one of the, you know, one of the big things in our community uh, is just a lack of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had such a tremendous amount of growth. We're blessed in that way economically sure. with a lot of opportunities. Our university, of course, draws a lot of people. Our businesses, uh, you know, there, there's just a lot of great things going on in our community. Uh, but one of the things that uh, it sort of kind of snuck up on us as you have so much growth in such a short period of time, uh, you don't have some of the normal housing cycles that create affordable housing. So we tend to build what our, con we're, we're a very consumer driven, um, you know, housing industry mm -hmm. here. Uh, and so we're building a whole lot of, of nice uh, single family homes. We're building a whole lot of very nice, high end, large multifamily complexes. Right. We're not building anything in the middle. And that tends to have been historically, uh, say ever since World War II and, and on, mm -hmm. uh, that tends to be where our affordable housing comes from as it cycles. Uh, as, as it ages. Uh, and of course, we haven't had that ability to, to age or the inventory uh, to age. So for a lot of folks, man, they're, every bit of, of income they have, they're putting into housing. I can imagine, um, yeah. And so that leaves, of course, no money for, for other things and, and everything becomes unstable when it gets out of balance like that. You mentioned a Christian outreach being a journey home. Was this started by a church or a number of churches in the community? How did it come about? Well, um, yes and no. Um, it, it actually uh, was a call that, um, that I felt God put on my life November 6, 1982. I was a high school student just outside of Memphis. I was born and raised in, in the Memphis area. I was at a, a, a youth camp. Uh, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, and, and uh, it's a connectional church, so we had all of our district's youth were at a camp, mm -hmm. and, and we had uh, teaching and worship. and, and uh, and I had an experience that night that, that led me to this, although it was really just a planting of a seed. So I tell people all the time, if you believe that God's planting a seed in you, it might take a while for that seed to germinate okay, and, the, and the, the circumstance to, to really come together. Uh, it was 22 years later for me uh, okay. that, that what uh, is now the journey home sort of started back in 2004. Uh, I, I went on to you know school and and in the business world for for many years and and came under conviction in 2004 that now was the time and I was now in the place uh, to to kind of do this um, and so uh, when I started sharing with uh, church leaders and community leaders uh, what we intended to do here uh, one of the uh, things that that almost everybody uh, shared with me is said well gosh Scott you're never going to be able to get all those churches mm -hmm. to, to work together on a project. <laughs> Heck, you can't even get churches in the same denomination to work together on a project. <laughs> and and I, uh, I just laughed and I said, well, you know, that's God's problem. That's not Scott's problem. That's way above my pay grade. All mm -hmm. I can do is make the opportunity available. <laughs> and, uh, and let me tell you, it is so wonderful because we have churches uh, just of every tradition, big churches, small churches, every denomination uh, working together, wonderful. serving the community over at Journey Home. Okay. In fact, the journey home wouldn't exist. Kim, give us a little bit more information about your background, uh, how you got to where you are now with Rutherford County Schools. <laughs> well, I was a school counselor mm -hmm. um, for a number of years, and we moved to Murfreesboro in 2000, and I was a counselor at Smyrna Primary School. In 2001, um, McKinney Vento, the federal law that governs nearly all homeless programs in the United States, was reauthorized under the No Child Left Behind Act. Okay. And at that time, it was mandated that every school system must have a liaison for homeless education. So uh, before that, it had been at the state level mm -hmm. and very little was being identified or very few homeless children were being identified in many places in most school districts. Only really in the large school districts that had a lot of shelters like in Nashville and Memphis and 
um, other places around the country. So I was the counselor at Smyrna Primary School at that time. And um, our district uh, decided that every school needed to have a contact for homeless mm -hmm. education. I became that contact. And then when um, the person who was serving in the role of homeless liaison or Atlas liaison uh, moved into a different position, the job came open and um, I had attended the conference the previous year of the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth. And um, so I was one of the people in the <coughs> district that had a little bit more experience okay. than anybody else. And um, so I interviewed for the position and um, it really has, has turned into a, a calling um, as well. I think it's hard to work with these families and not really feel their pain and their um, frustration with, with the way things are working. Um, Scott was talking about the growing numbers of homeless families and when you think about, because you know we don't think about doubled up being homeless so much, but families are so afraid, parents are so afraid to go into shelters or right. we don't have enough shelters. Right. right now we have three rooms for families at the Salvation Army. Um, many, if it, a woman in children's shelter won't take boys over the age of 12. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, mm -hmm. a 12, 13 year old boy, uh, you don't really have a place to go if those three rooms at the Salvation Army are full. They don't, they don't want to live in the motels because you know we know what I mean, they do, many of them do, because they have no other choice. But um, so they, they try to stay with somebody else. And frequently, those are highly unstable situations. They move from place to place. They're not always with a loving pair of grandparents who have you know, three extra like bedrooms. Sure. What we when see. When you say doubled up, is that when two families are together? Or? It is when one family moves in with another with family, another family. Uh -huh. because of a loss of housing. Okay. Um, and frequently what we see is those children are walking on eggshells, trying not to make somebody mad so that they all get kicked out of their home. Or they are staying in a place where the adults are up until all hours of the morning and the child may be sleeping on the couch or on the floor in the kitchen. Um, so we're not seeing, you know, the, the John Boy Walton type of, you know, multi-generational families. Mm -hmm. You know, um, John, one of the things that's so um, relevant here to the point Kim's making about families being doubled up, doubled up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in fact, a lot of times people don't even really think about that as being homeless or unstably housed, but the fact of the matter is when families are doubled up due to economic circumstances, typically those, uh, the duration of that stay doesn't last very long. So it may be a few days, mm -hmm. a few weeks. Imagine as a school child, if you're moving around from place to place every week or two, and you're not really sure where you're gonna be mm -hmm. um, next week. Uh, obviously that has to be a distraction to learning, but the, the thing is that creates trauma in a child's life, you know? Sure and um, as you get so many people together in such a dense setting, um, we, we find that a lot of those folks have other issues, you know, that, that have sort of led them to be there. Uh, and those uh, issues tend to be generational mm -hmm. in their support networks. Um, so we have, um, you know, there are reasons that people become homeless or, or unstably housed. Um, it may relate to uh, losing jobs. It may relate to a lack of education or, or lack of training or being prepared. Uh, it may relate to a criminal background or other type things like mm -hmm. that. Um, but it also may relate to mental health issues or issues of trauma. Um, those things are, are so prevalent in our community uh, and they're not things that are easily solved. Kim, I'm sure you're housed at the Rutherford County Schools headquarters. But what is your, give, give us an idea of a typical day. Oh, wow. Actually, my office is located behind Barfield Elementary School. Oh, okay. A few years ago, um, I bought a portable building mm -hmm. and put my office and storage space there because we have, we keep school supplies, we take donations of school supplies, hygiene supplies, and we have one church that does a coat drive for us every year. Mm -hmm. And we get those out to the schools, to the homeless children there, the Atlas kids, as well as um, school snacks and weekend food bags. 
So our office it has a lot of storage. I also have some training space. And I have an assistant who works um, two days, two and a half days a week. Um, and she coordinates all of the donations um, from the community and deliveries to the schools. But um, I do a lot of communicating with the contacts at the schools. They call me if they have a question. They send their paperwork. Um, and we, we provide services such as transportation to try to keep the child in the same school for the whole year, even if they are moving from place to place okay. or from a home to a shelter to a motel. You know, and um, that's, that's a big part of it. We also work with uh, Boys and Girls Club to make sure that they can all, as many as possible, can attend their summer program. And then they also um, allow them to participate in their after school program. Um, but we wanna give them a safe place to be during the summer and um, food, you know, meals. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with Endure Athletics, um, which also provides after school, summer, weekend activities for mostly kids living in motels and um, just a lot of different community agencies, um, a lot of different departments within the school district, and of course, all of the schools. So I do a lot of training, I do, we, we do a lot of um, just outreach and uh, delivering of, of those services, providing school supplies, uh, trying to talk with the kids when they are missing a lot of school or find out what's going on, um, all of that. What a complicated issue. It is. And wonderful what you two do and cause to happen in the county and the city and throughout the whole community. Didn't realize we had as much of a problem as we do have. Well, you yeah. know, with all the growth we've had over the last 30 years, right. um, as a friend of mine, Tom Christie, said to me one day and it really stuck in my mind, he said, you know, everyone coming to our area is not a captain of industry. Uh, and that's very true. Good point. Yeah, when when true. you have a, a large growth in population, you have it in all segments. Oh, yeah. All absolutely. of the segments mm -hmm. grow uh, substantially. And um, so you have to make sure that, that we're actually um, creating opportunity okay. for that whole, you know, across, yeah. the, across the realm there. You know, one of the things that's been a, a real help in our community, uh, which uh, Kim is currently on the executive committee, uh, with the Housing, Health, and Human Services Alliance of Rutherford County. Um, and I've, I served as its chairman for the its, uh, first five years. And um, we, we have a, a, a continuum of care. We have an, an agency of agencies uh, that come together to collaborate, uh, to coordinate care. Um, you know, we have a system whereby uh, if a person comes into our community uh, that is homeless, they check in at one of our shelters or things of that nature, then we can actually gather their information and make it known to all the members of our community that they're here and these are the needs that they have. Um, so, you know, we, we've been doing some things proactively as a community for some time, sure. um, but there's just so much more that needs to be done. Scott and Kim, thank you for joining us on our program, giving us an idea of the other side of our community, if you will, that we sometimes know so little about and appreciate the wonderful work you're doing. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Scott Foster, the Executive Director of Journey Home, and Kim Snell, who is the Atlas Liaison for the students of Rutherford County Schools. Thank you for joining us for Murphy Park Storytelling.